Hi guys, welcome back. And today we're going to take kind of a, a bit of a darker turn with our discussion because we're really going to start talking about once the, the final solution, once Hitler's diabolical plans are set into motion, um, what happens? And mainly they create concentration camps or, or extermination or death camps, whichever term you prefer to use. So today's notes um, are all going to be about kind of the creation of these, these the, the transition from the mobile killing squads of the Eisten Group into the concentration camps and the, the death camps that are created during World War II to deal with uh, the extermination of the Jews, which was uh, Hitler's ultimate goal. So today you need to add these to your notes and be prepared to talk about them much more in depth in class. But some of the things we need to talk about are the camps themselves. So around 1 million people had our Jews had already been killed by the SS before these camps were created. But eventually the Nazis decide that the Eisten Gruppen is not basically killing them fast enough. That mobile death squad is not killing them fast enough. And so they decide to build labor camps um, as what they initially called them. But eventually they're going to be called death camps or work camps. Um, and the extermination camps, I mean. And they're going to be used to uh, systematically eradicate uh, the, the Jews from Europe. And so one of the biggest ones is Shemno, and it's established in 1941, and it's three gas chambers used carbon monoxide, so basically what kind of comes out of the tailpipe of your car. And Shemno was a small town about 50 miles outside of Lotz in Poland, and it in total kills about 145,000 people, which is smaller compared to most, but it does have a distinctive place in history because it's the kind of the test ground. It's the first site uh, for the killing of the Jews by gas. And so it's one of the first ones that will use this as a tactic. And then they'll kind of trans uh, add this around to all the other uh, extermination camps and, and use this to, to as a means for to an end, as a means to be able to, to uh, eradicate the Jewish population. Now we're going to talk about a lot more other, a lot of other, uh, uh, concentration camps in class, but there's a few other ones that I want to talk about and just kind of show you. So one is uh, Buchenwald. Um, there is also Bergen-Belsen, and this is a photo of a soldier who, after the liberation of the camp, who has found a large open pit with um, hundreds of bodies that had been killed and that are, are cast off into there. In the final days of the war, the Nazis kind of knew what was coming and, and started to try to cover up what they had done. And so a lot of times they would build these large mass graves and then try to you know throw all the bodies in and cover them up quickly in hopes of doing it before the Allies came to kind of mask truly what they had done. Um, to no avail, they many of the times they would end up leaving the camps entirely, leaving the people locked into their into their bunkhouses or locked into the the the, play, the camps themselves to starve to death. Um, compared, or especially seeing as they were getting very little food, anyways. But they left them to kind of starve to death and take care of themselves until the allies come. One of the ones we'll talk about in greater detail in class is Dachau, and this is actually a picture of Dachau's uh, crematorium. They had a number of crematoriums, but what they would do is once you once you had died, they'd place your body on a plank and slide you into this uh, cremation uh, 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 furnace, and you would the attempt was they they couldn't bury bodies fast enough, so rather than than bury them, they would burn them. And a lot of other camps will do this too, but Dachau is very famous for its crematoriums. There's a lot of pictures of them that we'll talk about. And we'll show you more in class, but. One of the things that's the most striking thing about Dachau is when the when the Allies make it there in 1945 in April of that year, they find a series of trains that are outside of train cars that are outside of the camp, and inside the train cars they find roughly two to three thousand people who had been loaded in the train and were being sent to Dachau when the the SS guards decide to give up the camp and 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 flee. And many of them were just left on the train car. Some people were, were shot and killed before that. Others were just left there to starve and die in a locked train car. And, and when they, they liberate the camp, um, they will find this time and time again at not just Dachau, but other camps as well. Um, the one of the biggest and most notorious of all is Auschwitz. Um, we will talk a lot more about this in class. I don't. I just want you to understand that it's a camp. Um, it's one we will focus on in particular. But just kind of some statistics and some information about some of the camps. Um, in total, there were six extermination camps that were mainly placed through Poland, and Auschwitz was the biggest. And about thirty percent of people were put into labor camps. That would mean it was like slave labor. You'd go and you'd work maybe in a factory or maybe farming or you'd be doing some other task to help the, the Reich, help the Nazis, while the other 70% were sent straight to gas chambers to die um, at these extermination camps. And this is a picture actually on the right here of an American soldier after they've liberated a camp um, touring it and seeing the gas chambers themselves. And, and I'll give you a little more examples and we'll talk about this more in, in class two. I don't mean to just kind of brush through these things, but I want you to kind of understand that 
We're going to go into this much deeper when we talk about it later. Um, one of the things that would happen when you would get to these camps, a lot of times if you were not immediately put into the gas chambers, you'd be tattooed with a prison number many times on your arm. And there's still survivors of the Holocaust today that still have their tattoos on their arms. So it's even though this has ended over 50, 60 years ago, there's still that constant reminder of what you have gone through and the, the, that everlasting kind of impact that the Nazis had on your life as, as a Jewish person or somebody that was deemed an enemy of the state. You still have those today. I'm going to show you a series of pictures also, too, just to kind of give you a bit of a, the gravity of the situation, what happened. Um, this is a picture of a couple of the next ones I'm going to show you are some pictures of uh, constant, of the gas chambers at Auschwitz. Um, usually they were large, like cinder block or concrete buildings you'd be put into. They looked like showers a lot of times. They would have uh, shower heads hanging from the ceiling. Um, they used what was called Cyclone B. It was a... a, a gas that would um, it looked like little little beans and when it was exposed to air it would quickly dissipate and it would clog the lungs and choke you to death and what they would do is they would open a hatch on top of these gas chambers and pour this in or in the case of uh, Shemlo where they used carbon monoxide a lot of times they would back trucks up into uh, a, a a pipe um, and, and hook up the gas the, the exhaust, exhaust pipe to to the uh, other pipes that would then filter that air down and through the shower heads and poison people in that way. Um, it, inside of those gas chambers, uh, panic would often set in when people started to realize what was happening. And there's claw marks on there, and there's 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 scratch marks on the wall, and and kind of reminders of the people who were there inside some of these as they were trying desperately to do anything to to get to safety and and to free themselves. Um, the Nazis, when you would arrive, would take all of your possessions. So they would take any shoes you were wearing, they take any clothing you're wearing, um, and 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 that would become part of the right, part of their their theirs now. And so if you go to a lot of these camps, you can see photos of or and and see piles upon piles of shoes, for instance. Uh, it, they would take everything, shoes. Um, this is a pile of eyeglasses that were taken from people who had passed away. Um, they would also shave your head, and women in particular, they would shave your head and use your hair to make what's called hair blankets, and those would be sold throughout the Reich to, to help make money. So you would be kind of uh, stripped of your womanhood very quickly, or something that would make you more feminine by, by shaving your head and, and, and making you uh, uh, kind of look like everybody else. They, their, their goal was to dehumanize you as much as possible, to make it easier for your captors to be able to kill you. Also, they lived in bunkhouses, lived in very tight quarters. And those of you who've read Night Before, Elio Wiesel does a really good job of talking about the, the experiences of what happened while he's in the camp and then even after his life and dealing with, with what happened to him. But if you, as you can see here, there's a lot of people very tightly crammed into each of these spaces. You have maybe a couple of feet at most of personal space, but there's hundreds of people maybe crammed into a very small, tiny area. So... Yes, you are alive, but you are suffering just from starvation, from disease, from lice, from uh, uh, cramped quarters in close contact with people. It's not a very uh, palatable way to live, and it's something that a lot of people struggle with throughout the war. Um, we will talk much more tomorrow about what it's like to live in the camps, and we'll also talk about some of the twisted ideologies of a man by the name of Dr. Joseph Mengele. Um, and kind of what his experiments are and what his, his ideology is and how he really begins to devalue people and devalue their life. But for today, I just want to make sure that you have these in your notes. So if you have any questions um, or any comments, please come see me in class. Make sure you have these in your notes. Um, and we will talk about this in much greater detail tomorrow, and we'll listen to some first-hand accounts of the experience. We'll read something, some stuff from, from some, uh, some of the survivors who have, who have lived through this so you can get kind of a better idea of, of what life was like, because I can tell you what life was like, but you don't know unless you actually listen to the experiences of others. Until then, have a great day, everybody. Bye.